Bless Morning Church. God is amazing. He is awesome. He is good. And I'm telling you, like I tell you every week, He loves you so much. Listen, there's a, a song that we sing often, right? It says, today is the day, right? Because scripture even says, today is the day that the Lord has made, so I will rejoice and be glad in it. It encourages us to do that. So I'm going to open this up in prayer, and I want to encourage you. I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what circumstance you may be facing, you know, other than obviously, obviously the pandemic. But I'm telling you, if you choose this day to say, today is the day, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it, you watch what the Lord does, even today in your life, and see how it doesn't set forth a, 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 a chain reaction of, of the Lord uh, showing goodness in from his heart to yours and you seeing it manifest in your life. But let me pray for us. Father, I thank you that you do love us so much. I thank you that today is that day where we can rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. Because every day is that day. Because every day is given to us by you. We have a reason to praise you. We have a reason to rejoice, Lord. And if some people feel like they don't have one, Lord, I pray that you reveal to them a reason that they have to praise you and rejoice. So Lord, let our worship this morning, tonight, in the afternoon, whenever somebody's watching this, Lord, let it be pleasing to you. And Lord, let it persuade and convince our hearts of your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. We love you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's worship together.
day where we can worship you and give you all the praise, Lord. All the praise, all the honor, it goes to you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid. Lord, I thank you that we can give you all of our fears and sorrows. Lord, that we will stand upon your truth. In all of our days, truly, we will live for you. Let that be the the conviction of our hearts, Lord, to mean those words which we sing. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you so much. Now, I have a new song um, that I want to I want you guys to learn and, and listen to. It's called No Longer Slaves, and maybe some of you have heard it maybe on the radio or something before, but it talks about how we're no longer slaves to fear, but it reminds us that we are children of God, and as a child of God, we do not need to be bound by fear. Listen, the enemy loves to put fear on us. He loves to make us afraid whether it's afraid of what's going on in the world, maybe it's sometimes it's being afraid of people or afraid of each other. That fear, I'm going to tell you and remind you all the time, is not from the Lord. That is not from God. And I've prayed this many times over our church, but the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So when you have that spirit of fear, I want you to remember this song as we sing it, And as you learn it, that you can sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. So let's sing that together. And if you don't know the melody, we'll sing it. And as you pick it up, sing right along. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. From my enemies Till all my fears are gone Let's sing this together, it goes like this I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Sing it again, I'm no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear For I
to be slaves to fear. Lord, the devil loves to put fear inside of us. He loves to make us afraid of so many things. He, especially when it comes to things we don't know the answers to, when it comes to the future, when we can't predict things that are going to happen, even specifically with this pandemic. But Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the ruler of this world. The true king here is King Jesus. You are in control, Lord. And if we put our trust in you, we need not have any fear. But Lord, I feel like you're reminding us that requires us to actually have a trust in you. Because, Lord, I know your word says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, Lord, I don't think you're just going to arbitrarily, randomly help people out, even the ones who don't even think about you or care about you. But, Lord, you're looking for the people who are going to say, God, I trust you. God, I look to you. Jesus, I fix my eyes upon you. You're looking for those people who are going to say that. Because Lord, I believe if you were just to bless everybody on the earth fully and completely without them having any acknowledgement of you, Lord, you could even bless us, Lord, straight to an eternity without you. Because we would not know the one who was blessing us. We would just think it was ourselves. We would think that we were the ones who made ourselves strong or we were the ones who made ourselves prosperous. But no, Lord, you're looking for people who will cry out to you, cry out to their heavenly father and say, Lord, I need you. And Lord, I believe you. Lord, when you say that I don't need to fear any evil because you're with me, I believe it. Lord, let that be the truth of our hearts. Let us really be meaning that when we say it. Lord, let our faith that we have, let it be manifested through actions of faith, Lord. Because you did say in your word that faith without works is dead. And that doesn't mean you believe in the existence of God and then on the side you have you know, random good works. That's not what you're talking about. But that the faith that we have in you causes us to walk it out. Lord, you said we walk by faith, not by sight. So Lord, I, I pray that we would be a people. Everybody even who's a part of Living Hope Church and everybody who's just listening as a guest, Lord, um, through the YouTube service. Lord, I pray that all of us would be people who genuinely look to you, who genuinely trust in you. Because, Lord, so many things could happen in the future. Things may not go the way we want or the way we expect them to go. But Lord, when we put our trust in you, we know that we are okay. Lord, you promise in your word for those who trust in you. You said I, I, that you surround uh, the righteous with favor like a shield. And then some people might say, yeah, but I'm not really righteous. How can I trust that the Lord's gonna surround me with favor? Oh, but if you believe in Jesus, if you've been washed in the blood of the lamb, you have been made righteous, not in and of yourself, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's why all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So we thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. 
who gives us the confidence because of what he did. He gives us the confidence to come boldly to your throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in our time of need. So Lord, this is why we want to be able to sing to you that we are not slaves to fear, but we are children of God. Thank you, Lord. That even as we sang in this song where we said, you split the sea so I could walk right through it. And my fears were drowned in perfect love. Lord, that's based on scripture because it says in your word that your perfect love will cast out fear. And maybe there's some listening right now who says, someone listening who says, I don't feel God's perfect love. I don't think God loves me at all. Lord, I, I just, right now, I command that lie of the enemy, whoever's thinking that, to be gone in Jesus' name. And I declare, Lord, that you begin to reveal your tremendous heart of love for that person or those people, that they would know that their fear can be cast out by your perfect love. And I declare as they put their faith in you for that, that it will be done for them, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Lord, we understand that we are going through such a trying time right now in the midst of this pandemic. But I thank you, Lord. And I quote this many times in prayer and when I'm speaking, Lord, but you said in your word, though I might walk through the valley of the shadow of death, though I might walk through the darkest of valleys, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That is the truth. That is the truth that we can hold on to and believe in, Lord. So let us fear no evil. Let us not be people who react based on fear, Lord, but people who walk based on faith in you. We love you, Lord. And we praise you for everything that you've done in our lives, everything that you're currently doing, even in the midst of this crisis, Lord, and everything that you will do in the future. We pray with expectancy and hope that you will do a mighty work in us, through us, and for us if we put our faith in you. We love you and we praise you for all these things. In the mighty name of Jesus, we all pray. And together we said, amen. Amen. Man, God is so good. He is so good and he loves you so, so much. Please put your trust and your hope in him. Please believe in him. Not just in his, ex in his existence. But believe what he says. As you open your Bible, as you open the scriptures, God's going to speak something to you. I promise you he will if you open your hearts and ask him to do it. He will speak to you and show you things in his word. And you'll be like, wow, I know this, is, this was written 2,000 years ago, but it's almost like God is speaking to me right now. I'm telling you that can happen. And I want to encourage you in that. So be blessed by the, the message that's going to come forth from our pastor, Bill Wilcox. Be blessed by it. And I, I, I pray that the word that he speaks, the word that he brings forth, that's straight from God, that it goes on the good ground of your hearts and it reaps a hundred times what was originally planted. God bless you and be blessed by the message. Greetings to our Living Hope Church family, and to seekers and friends across the globe. We're grateful that you would join us this day, our Lord's Day, September 13th, 2020, for the worship service of Living Hope Church in Yucca Valley, California. Wasn't that a great time of worship with Eric and the worship team? So appreciate their effort and the preparation that they put in and the execution as they sing those songs and clearly they are worshiping the Lord, not just performing a service. So we're grateful to them for this time of worship. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements that I want to make and then we're going to dive right into our study, uh, continuing study in the book of Colossians. Uh, first of all, Appreciate those of you that joined us Friday night for the movie night up in the amphitheater. Keep an eye on your email. We'll let you know when the next movie night is planned. But what a great time as we uh, shared together in that time to uh, watch the movie and to enjoy fellowship with one another. So 
God bless you that came. Also, guys that joined us yesterday for the Zoom Bible study, our monthly men's Bible study. What a great time as we studied God's Word together. And uh, we do that on the second Saturday of the month. And if you'd like to be part of that Bible study, send me an email and let me know your interest there, man. And uh, my email address uh, will be changing, but for right now, it is still Pastor Bill at efcyv.org. And then last, but certainly not least, I want to invite you out to the evening service this evening as we meet up in the amphitheater. Uh, there is a, an important change. We will be meeting at 6.30, not 7. We'll meet at 6.30 up in the amphitheater for a time of actual in-person worship. We've changed the time to the earlier 6.30 time because uh, it's getting darker uh, earlier now. And so we want to capture the daylight and, and also with it getting darker earlier, that means it's cooling down earlier. So if you're local, join us for a great time of fellowship and of worship, we will be practicing our social distancing, and uh, we encourage you to to bring a face covering of some sort, and uh, especially if you're in a situation where you're not able to maintain that six-foot distance from someone who is not part of your household. But God bless you, and thanks for joining our time together, this worship service of Living Hope Church of Yucca Valley. Uh, I will be in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, and uh, we're going to dive right into that, and so grab your Bibles, follow along. I'll be reading 3.22 in Colossians from verse 22 in chapter 3 through verse 1 of chapter 4, and then I'd like to pray for our time together, all right? Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. <clears throat> It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and without that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, awesome in power, amazing in your kindness and mercy to us. Lord, we thank you that we can come right now into your presence and know that you hear us. Lord, as I uh, film this, I, I celebrate that you're hearing me as I speak to you and that your children as they listen to this, can know that you are with them right now in their living rooms, uh, wherever they may be as they watch this worship service. Lord, may they know your strength and power and presence with them. And so, Lord, we lift up this time to you. I pray that this portion of your word would be abundantly clear uh, to your children, I pray especially for those seekers after the truth who have yet to receive Jesus into their hearts, Lord, that you would speak to them in a powerful way as they watch and listen to your word being explained. And to, to that end, Father, for, for their understanding, for all our understanding, I ask, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, even now. Speak through me as I seek to 
expose and expand the word of God to open their eyes that they might more readily understand it and apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, an interesting passage of Scripture, I would remind you, we were covering uh, God's guidance for households, Christian households, last week particularly. We were looking at what God has to say about the relationships in a family household situation, the relationship of the wife to the husband and the role that the wife plays in that the relationship of the husband to the wife and the role of the husband and what his responsibilities are to her. And then children to parents. How do you be a godly child? Well, God's word tells us. And then last of all was the role of the, of the father to the children and the importance of dad's role in being a parent and ministering to his children. Today, and and in this portion of Scripture, we move from the kind of under the same roof situation to what was then uh, in the first century and is now in the 21st century, very common situation for us all that we are part of a workplace. And so the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, addressed some of those issues with respect to the workplace. And so it it answers the question here, how does our relationship with Christ affect our relationships in the workplace and our work, as it were? Also, what does God value in the workplace? What does he value for us to do and be in that work environment? And if we can see what God values, then we can arrange our priorities to line up with what's important to him. And I see four things here. First, humble submission. Second, enthusiastic attitude. Third, honesty and integrity. And fourth, justice and fairness. By the way, I provide uh, structured notes to help you follow along, and I have a substantial email list of folks that I send those to uh, every week so that you can open those up and follow along. There's no copyrights or anything like that. We're glad for you to get God's Word, and if this helps you study it with me, then, then God bless you. And if you would like Uh, to receive those notes but aren't receiving them, send me an email. Uh, Shoot me an email to that address that I uh, mentioned to you just a minute ago. So let's look at the first thing that God values in the workplace. He values humble submission. He says, slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Now, we're going to travel back to the first century. I I need to give you a couple of cautions as we look at this section of Scripture. Caution number one, be careful here. There is not an exact correlation between first century slaves and 21st century employees, uh, modern day employees. One difference, how many of you live with your boss? Husbands, put your hands down. Uh, The boss provides the food in in the master-slave relationship. A roof over the head, there's no salary generally involved in those master-slave relationships. So it's not an exact parallel. A second caution, the Bible And this is an incredibly important one that you understand, that we understand together. The Bible is not condoning slavery. It is not condoning slavery. It is simply acknowledging its existence, that slavery was a dominant element of first century 
life is apparent from the history books from that period. But what we have here is a snapshot of life in the first century Roman culture. Some historians actually estimate that upwards of 50% of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. So it was a dominant feature. That was their labor force. That's how they worked. And so what we're seeing here is God addressing the reality of the situation without condoning it. God is not saying slavery, the sin of slavery is okay, but by his grace, he works with people and teaches us how to live and how to operate even in an ungodly, sinful situation. Now, that doesn't mean we can't learn something from what he tells the slaves with respect to their masters, the masters with respect to their slaves. And so there are some timeless principles that we can glean from here. First, I, I, uh, as we look at these verses, I see three timeless principles with respect to this first priority of God that we live in humble submission, that we operate. First is we should be submissive in attitude and behavior to those who are over us. Who's over us today? Well, uh, if we're employees, then our employer is over us. Our supervisors are over, over us. If we're students full-time, our teachers are over us. And all of us are told in several places in Scripture to submit to the governing authorities. And so we should be submissive in attitude and behavior. In all things, he says, obey. It's the same word as the one directed to children in verse 20, to, to sit under. But just as with the children and with the wives who are, who are told there to be submissive to their husbands, there are moral boundaries to that submission. We're not commanded to do things against God's will and, and law. Even if that employer, that master tells us to. Another timeless principle given to slaves here is that a, an honest and diligent work ethic. An honest and diligent work ethic. I'm going to do the best, to the best of my ability, I'm going to do this job that I've been given to do. I'm going to accomplish what this individual wants me to accomplish. And not with external service, not just on the outside. We see a difference between working hard with a right attitude and bootlicking for self-promotion. A third timeless principle from the importance of our submission is sincerity our sincerity reflects our walk with the Lord. Sincerity of heart, he finishes the verse, fearing the Lord. Our sincerity is a reflection of our relationship with Christ. Our insincerity would be a reflection of our old nature. And so, sister, brother, in Christ, follower of Jesus, we're to submit humbly, to those that are over us, to our bosses, and so forth. God values humble submission. A second thing that God values in the workplace is an enthusiastic attitude. An enthusiastic attitude. Colossians 3, 23 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men with enthusiasm, with all your heart. Do it. Get into it. Work. This is an overarching principle that applies to us all, not just to the, to the slave, not just to the employee. Verse 17, 
indicates that everything we do should be done in submission to the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. And so this is another way in which we're told whatever we do, do heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. How does this principle of heartily working for the Lord work itself out in, in our lives, in, in, in my life? I can tell you in my job, I work as though Jesus were my supervisor. After I got saved, I was 18 years old, and I held many jobs after that. I worked in the oil fields. I worked in a, a carbon black factory. I worked in a, a camper factory. I delivered flowers. And I worked as though Jesus himself were my direct supervisor. So that meant there were a lot of things I didn't say, think, or do. That also meant there were a lot of things I did say and do. In the classroom, I was a freshman in college. I worked as though Jesus was the one that gave me the assignment and as though he were the one that were, was going to be grading the assignment. And so I wanted to get the most out of it and do the most that I could. In sports, I work as though Jesus were both my coach and the referee. So I worked hard and did what the coach said, and I followed the rules, and I followed them from my heart. And if I violated, even by accident, I owned up to it immediately. If you're an entrepreneur or business owner, serve your clientele as though Jesus himself were the customer. Serve your clientele as though Jesus himself were the customer. And then verse 24, he says, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And he sums it up because he's the one that gave us the ability, both mental and physical, to do the job. And he's the one that brought that job to pass for us to do. It is the Lord Christ. He's the one doing our evaluation. And the basis for his evaluation is not just how the, our human boss views us, but his evaluation is from our heart. What were our motives? How were we working? So whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord. A third value that should be reflected in the workplace is the value of honesty and integrity. Now, we, we sort of pull that out from a negative command here where he says in verse 25, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done and that without partiality. This directive applies, I think, both to the slave and to the master. In terms of a general principle, there's a warning here not to do wrong, especially in the workplace. He who does wrong will receive the consequences. What do we do wrong in the workplace? Well, we shirk, we cut corners, we do things we're not supposed to. How many people grab that handful of pens out of the out of the container and take it home or make personal copies on the company copy machine. I, you, you can fill in the blanks and the rationalizations are bad. But he says, he who does wrong will receive the consequences. And so there is the general principle here that we reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says that explicitly. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. And he goes on to talk about sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit, and the, the negative you, you, you reap from the flesh, the positive from the spirit. 
sowing and reaping. The future element of, uh, of the verse in Colossians 3.25, it indicates that even though someone may get away with wrong behavior here and now, they will ultimately have to give an accounting for it. They won't get away with it forever. So our behavior in the workplace has consequences. And so we need to do our work with honesty and integrity. The fourth thing God values in the workplace is directed specifically to the master's in, in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. And so the fourth thing that God values in the workplace is justice and fairness. Remember, and it's been a long time since we began our study in the book of Colossians, but as we looked at the uh, the background of the book, the author and the, the date of the writing and the place of the writing and the occasion of it, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae when he was in a Roman prison. Rome was several hundred miles away from Colossae. Rome, of course, is in Italy. Colossae is in modern-day Turkey. And so even if you went by sea, which was the more direct route, it was still hundreds of miles. Paul wrote this letter to the church, and his, his method of delivery was to give it to a person who hand-carried the letter. And the person he gave it to to carry the letter was a guy named Onesimus. He's a guy that Paul met there while he was in prison in Rome, and Paul shared the gospel with him. He led Onesimus to Christ. And Onesimus then followed the Lord by staying there and, and, and serving with and serving Paul himself. And so Paul wrote a letter, not just the letter to the church in Colossae, but he wrote a letter to a fellow in Colossae by the name of Philemon. And perhaps you've seen the book of Philemon in the New Testament. That's the letter, along with this Colossian letter that Paul sent with Onesimus to take back. Why is that significant? Because Onesimus was a slave of Philemon's. And he ran away from Philemon, escaped to Rome, and that's where Onesimus came to know Christ through the ministry of Paul, and then Paul sent him back to his master, Philemon. And Onesimus brought these letters to the church and to sort of a letter of, of recommendation from Paul to his master, to Philemon. So now Paul directs this to the masters and the master-slave relationship. Again, not an exact parallel, one-to-one uh, -one parallel, but as with the slave-to-master relationship, I see at least two timeless principles from this instruction to the masters. And, and I would believe it applies not just to the masters, but it applies to the, to the slaves as well. So in this case, to the employers and the employees. The first timeless principle, treat people with fairness. Treat people with fairness, justice and fairness. If employers always did this, there would be far less unrest in the workplace. And if employees treated each other and their employer with justice and fairness, things would be a whole lot smoother. Now, for us, justice and fairness is uh, a little bit challenging. We operate in what's called a market-based economy. And in a market-based economy, the market dictates some things that aren't always fair. Uh, because the market is often driven not by value, 
but by greed. Let me give you some examples. Look at the, the real estate market. You buy a home for a certain amount of money. You live in that home for two years, five years, ten years, and you inflict normal wear and tear on the home, but you expect to turn around and sell that house for more money than you paid for it. Is that because the wood has gotten better, the flooring has gotten better with age? No, no. It's because of an artificial increase due to demand, basically due to greed. And so the house becomes more in value. Medical equipment is another example of this. Uh, as technology improves and increases in most industries, the cost of items goes down. Or certainly the quality goes up for the same cost, but not in the medical industry. Why? Because even though they, uh, they improve their work, resulting in a, in a cheaper cost of production, they're able to get away with raising the prices and increasing their profit margin. Uh, Big Pharma, another example of that. Gasoline prices based on demand. The price goes up of gasoline. What, does it cost them more to refine it when there's higher demand? No. They raise the price because they can. So in a market-based economy, fairness is not always the rule of the day. Why do I say all this? Because sisters and brothers, we need to be fair in our dealings with each other, our bosses, our employers, and uh, we need to deal with them with fairness. Masters are commanded to treat people with justice and fairness, and I believe that applies to us all. The other timeless principle Uh, spoken to the master, but I, I do indeed, I think it applies to us all. You are not an end in yourself. You are not an end in yourself. You will have to give an answer for how you treat your employees, how you treated your master, how you treat others. What does he say? You have a master. You too have a master in heaven. You'll have to give an answer to Almighty God for the way that you worked with your employees, the way that you treated them. Power is a big deal for some people. They love to lord it over, over others. Jesus uh, told his apostles, he said, that is not so among you. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, we're not going to turn there, but Jesus told his disciples the, the principle of servant leadership. Now, I'm not suggesting that your business is a church, but what I am suggesting is that you should have an attitude that cares for much, for, cares as much for the employee as a human being as that attitude that cares about the bottom line, that cares about the profit. Treat them as you would treat a brother in Christ. And why is that important? Because you need to look at Matthew 25, verse 40 and verse 45. In that sheep and goats judgment, Jesus says, the way that you treated one of these, my brothers, is the way that you treat me. And so we need to be careful to treat one another with justice and fairness. Okay. Master-slave relationship, a key part of the first century, though, again, it's not an exact parallel to our culture. We do see some similarities with the modern-day workplace. And we see some timeless principles for conduct in workplace relationships, whether you're an employee, whether you're an employer, we see, or an independent contractor, we see some timeless principles there. So God values in the workplace humble submission, 
an enthusiastic attitude, honesty and integrity and justice and fairness. So why is this important? Well, mainly this. If God has so arranged your life that you spend more time almost with the people at work than you do the people of your family, then those people at work are important to God. He put you there. And so you need to put them on your prayer list. And you need to pray for them. They're the ones who are going to see these godly priorities in your life. They're the ones whom you are going to minister to in your obedience to the Great Commission. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy to us. We thank you that your attitude is always perfect toward us, that you know our hearts, you know what we mean. And Lord, you don't hang us up with saying just exactly the right words to you because you know our hearts. You simply tell us to come and to pray. And so, Lord, I come with deep gratitude for the way that you have worked in our lives, the way that you gave your Son and saved us, the way that we can have a relationship with you simply by believing and receiving the Lord Jesus. I pray for those seekers watching this today, that you would work in their hearts to realize that you are the one, Jesus, standing at the door, knocking of their lives, seeking entrance into their lives. Oh, Lord, won't you work in them to open that door and receive Jesus for your children? Lord, some of us have, uh, have not done well with your priorities for our attitudes and actions in the workplace. Forgive us, Father, and renew us to, to embrace a, a humble attitude, an enthusiastic spirit to operate with fairness and be honest and people of integrity. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for what you're going to do in each of our lives as we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. And I exalt thee. 
Our benediction this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen.